Life Show. It is me, Susie Pettit, your certified life and wellness coach. And I am thrilled to bring you a guest today. And our guest is one of my um, favorite authors. And I am just so honored that she's on a Lovely Life Show. So let's dive in. Amy Morin is a licensed clinical social worker psychotherapist and psychology lecturer at Northeastern University. She's an international best-selling author and her three books have been translated into 35 languages. Her TEDx talk, which I will link in the show notes, this it's called The Secret of Becoming Mentally Strong. It is one of the most popular talks of all time with more than 8 million views. She's a regular contributor to Forbes, Inc., and Psychology Today, where her articles on mental strength reach more than 2 million readers each month. Her advice for building mental strength has been featured by major media outlets, including CNN, Oprah.com, Today, The Good Morning America Show, Success, Business Insider, Time, The Hallmark Channel, and now The Love Your Life Show. <laughs> so welcome, Amy. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Yay. So I didn't even mention the titles of your books and they are 13 things mentally strong. And the first one was mentally strong people do. And then you went on. Don't do. Don't do. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Don't do the big, the big kicker. And then you went on to write 13 things mentally strong parents don't do and 13 things mentally strong women don't do. Um, could you tell us a little about what got you to write the first book? Because your story is quite interesting and lends. Yeah, sure. I always tell people I'm an accidental author. I didn't mean to become an author. It just sort of happened in a strange way. So my career started as a therapist and I thought, this is great. I'll teach everybody the stuff that I learned in college and out of the textbook and help them build mental strength. But about a year into my journey, my mother passed away suddenly and unexpectedly. And for the first time ever, I was invested in, men in mental strength, not just because I wanted to teach it to other people, but because I needed it in my own life. And I would see people come into my therapy office who had gone through something maybe 25 years ago, and some of them were stuck. They felt like they were never able to be happy again. But then I'd see other people that had gone through all sorts of tragedy and difficulties and they were excited about life and they were really invested in, in making a brighter future. So I thought, all right, I'm going to figure out what makes the difference between these uh, two types of people that I'm seeing. And I, so I started studying them and paying really close attention. And I was glad that I did because on the three year anniversary of the day my mother died, my 26 year old husband died of a heart attack. And to be a 26-year-old widow without my mom was just, I can't even put it into words, even though I'm a therapist and I'm an author, um, and I should have feeling words or to be able to describe it. I really can't, <laughs> other than to just say it was really a dark, um, miserable place to be. And uh, But you know, by then I had learned that it wasn't always about what people did. Sometimes what helps people to be more resilient was more about what they didn't do. And so I worked on making sure I didn't have certain bad habits in my life. Uh, and I went through the grief and the pain and did everything I could to try to heal from it. And a few years later, I was fortunate enough to get married. I found love again. And I thought this is my next chapter in life and life was starting to look better. But just about as quickly as I got remarried, my father-in-law was diagnosed with cancer. And initially they said, no problem, we've got this. But after a few weeks, they said, actually, we don't. It's spread, it's out of our control, it's terminal. And they gave him a really poor prognosis. And I found myself thinking, this isn't fair. How come when something good happens, now I have to deal with grief all over again? I don't want to lose another loved one. But you know, if I'd really learned anything from everything I'd gone through by that point, it was that feeling sorry for myself wasn't going to be helpful. And so I sat down and I wrote a list of all the things that mentally strong people don't do. When I was done, I had a list of 13 things hmm. and I would read over that list as often as I, as I could, because it would help me when I was feeling down, when I was struggling, when I was starting to feel hopeless and helpless and I found it really helpful. So I thought, well, if this helps me, maybe it will help somebody else. So I published it online, stepped away from my computer. And, uh, before I knew it, millions of people had read that article and I really thought maybe one or two people would, would check it out, but I never imagined that it would go viral, but it made its way around the web. And before I knew it, Forbes picked it up and then it got 10 million views on the Forbes website and became one of their most viral articles mm. of all time and just sort of ballooned from there. And so it's been read now more than 50 million times. And in the midst of that, a literary agent called and said, you should write a book. But 
And to be honest, I didn't even know what a literary agent was. It wasn't anything <laughs> I had intended on, on doing. But the interesting part is when I wrote the article, it's basically just the list. I didn't give any context of the backstory of why I wrote it. And so all of these people who were reading it and these news outlets who were reaching out to me, they thought, wow, you wrote this list because you've mastered it. Hmm. And I hadn't. My secret was actually, no, I'm struggling with these things too. And so when it came time to wrote, write the book, I talked to my publisher and I talked to my agent and I said, I have sort of have a secret. I don't know if I want to tell it. I'm a therapist. I don't usually share my own vulnerabilities with the world. I'm used to listening to other people's stories. And uh, they were very kind and said, you don't have to share it, but boy, it may make you more credible. <laughs> and so I'm glad that I did. So when the first book came out, I was able to sort of say, okay, well, this is the rest of the story. I didn't just write this list because I mastered everything, but I wrote it because I came by it honestly. And I really struggled with these 13 things myself. And this is what worked for me. And I hope it will work for you too. Yeah, well, and I think that really does come out in the book, at least it does for me. Uh, I love how at the end of your chapters, you have, you know, what's helpful and what's not helpful. And, you know, really, my all my books, all three of your books are just totally highlighted. And I have little like post it notes sticking out of all of them. But they're well loved. I love my books. But um it, it is very clear and I very much appreciate that you share your story because that is something um, that then resonates with us. And it, and it, you know, I know, I can't remember if I had heard your story first or found the book first, but I do remember just, you know, hearing of your story and being in tears when, you know, you went through what happened with your mom and then you talked about how you went to the same basketball stadium with your husband and you thought at the time it would be a nice way to cleanse <laughs> and then you come home and he falls ill immediately you know and 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 I you that sharing of it is like oh yeah I can this is a human I can relate <laughs> to those moments you know when you're lying on the floor crying and okay well wait where's my list <laughs> let me right. and so right. did you did you find yourself sort of carrying your list around and like, how did it help you to think of these 13 things that you don't do? Yeah, so it started out, you know, just on a piece of paper that I did carry around with me. Mm -hmm. I had it in my pocket or okay. put it around in my purse. And I would just, you know, those moments where I just felt like, you know, this is hopeless, this is helpless, this isn't fair, I shouldn't have to be dealing with this. Just take out the list and think, okay, you know, there's a million and one things I could be doing right now. And, uh, you know, I don't have the energy, I don't have the time. So it just became better for me to think about just don't do these certain things and you'll be okay even if you do nothing today just make sure that mm -hmm. you don't engage in these bad habits because I knew that they would drag me down and you know I also knew as a therapist that grief is part of the healing process you have to feel bad you have to go through the pain and all of us go through painful times in our life whether it's a loss of a loved one or just a really rough patch in life. We all go through difficult circumstances, but we don't talk about it very much. Mm. And I just thought, you know, here I am, I'm a, I'm a therapist and I teach psychology and, and I intellectually know a lot of this stuff, but knowing it and doing it are two mm. separate things. And so having that list really just helped me say, okay, as long as you don't engage in these unhealthy habits, you won't get dragged down into the depths of despair so far that you can't pull yourself back out. Yeah, well, I really appreciate that. And that's one of the things that as a coach, I often, you know, am looking for little tools and ways that clients can sort of help themselves. And so listeners out there, feel free to print out a list <laughs> of these 13 things and just that that's, we're all human. And to be thinking of, um, these are some things to focus on, like, am I doing this? Am I feeling sorry for myself? Uh, could you speak a little as to why you wrote about the things you don't do versus the things you do do? Because you do it very well. You don't, um, I've read some articles on mothering where it's like, whatever you do, don't do this. And there are things that I do and I feel shamed or, and there's none of that in your books. There's none of this shaming aspect or how, you know, what a crazy mom you are for doing this. Um, and so how did you come about writing the don't do and, yeah, I'm glad that you said that because, you know, I certainly didn't want to shame anybody because the truth <laughs> is, I think in all three of my books, we do those 13 things. If we're honest, we all do them sometimes, but that they drain our mental strength. And it's not that if you do them, you're weak. We all possess mental strength to a degree. Hmm. We always have room for improvement. But I guess I wanted to talk about, you know, mental strength and, and mental health, sort of the same way we talk about physical strength and physical health. 
because I thought, you know, if I went to see a, a physical trainer, if I said, okay, I need to become more physically fit and my trainer said, great, start running on the treadmill. Well, then by all means I'd do it. But I'd be really upset if they didn't tell me to quit eating so much junk food because mm -hmm. I want my results to be, to be seen. And, you know, otherwise, what if I ran on the treadmill for an hour, but then I was so hungry, I, I ate twice as much as I normally did. And then I'd be upset. I'd think, well, this isn't working. And I realized as a therapist, I'd be doing people a disservice if I only talked about what they're doing well. And that's something that is really focused on in college. Things you learn is build on people's strengths, point out what they're doing well and tell them to keep doing that. Hmm. And I realized, well, yeah, but what if they're just doing one or two things and it makes all of their good habits counterproductive, but I don't point out that those one or two things really aren't that helpful. Mm. And so as I thought more about that and I was figuring things out and observing people in my office, I realized, okay, if you just get rid of these one or two things, that 101 things you're trying to do will be much more effective in your life and you'll start to see more results and you, you'll move forward. Otherwise, we're sort of like this hamster in a wheel who just goes around and around. And I had so many clients that would come in and they had read every self-help book out there and they just felt like they were running ragged and they would say, you know, I've done all this stuff and I'm, I'm trying to do more. And then they were feeling guilt and shame because they weren't doing enough. <laughs> And when really it was like, well, if you just get rid of these one or two things, then on then your good habits will will work. And so I really just wanted to say, this is how you work smarter and not just harder. Mm -hmm. I really like that. Have you heard feedback as to of that original list of thirteen and the mentally strong, um, the things mentally strong people don't do? Have you heard feedback as to what the number one or two things are? Or yeah, the uh, probably the one that I get the most feedback on is number two, which is that mentally strong people don't give away their power, mm. and at least at least once a day, but it's usually multiple times a day, I'll get uh, social media messages or emails from people who say, "Yeah, boy, I realized I was you know, giving my my mother in law too much power in my life, or my boss, or this neighbor, or this friend that I have," and it was really it's really about when you allow somebody to infiltrate your life in an unwanted way and you don't set healthy boundaries. And it might be that somebody, you say somebody makes you feel bad about yourself or that you have to go somewhere. You have to go to your mother-in-law's house for dinner on Sundays and you hate it. And it's really about taking back your power is saying, well, these things are a choice. Hmm. And just changing your language, reframing the way you think about stuff, recognizing you're in control of how you think, feel, and behave can empower you to create a much better life and for you to see that you're not just a victim of your circumstances, but that you're lucky enough to have those, the ability to decide, who do I want to spend my time with? How do I want to spend it? What do I want to do today? And even though a lot of the things we do sometimes feel like they're not a choice, like you go to work, yeah. it's a choice to go to work. You could stay home if you wanted and sure you wouldn't make any money. Maybe you'd get fired. There'd be certain consequences, but just acknowledging these things are choices uh, can really empower you to say, I'm going to change my life. It's up to me. And you feel better. And then you think more positively and then you take more positive action. It's this positive cycle you can create in your life. Oh, I just love that. I can see that as being an absolute number one <laughs> game changer. Um, that and that cues into the one that was one for me is that sort of feeling sorry for yourself and that victim piece because it makes it so you're like, well, you have choices. You're an adult. You get to choose. I love that. So then why did you from that book move on to writing a book for um, strong parents and then strong women? So when the first book came out, the most common question I was getting was, okay, how do I teach this to my kids? Mm. And the most common response people were saying to me is, I wish I would have learned this stuff earlier. If I could have learned this 20 years ago, the entire course of my life could have been different. Mm. And so I thought, okay, we really need to get this message into, into the hands of young people. And I could have written a book for 10 year olds, but I thought, you know, they're not going to then put the book down and, and change their lives. I need to teach parents. How do you become a mental strength coach? How can your parenting strategies affect your kids? How can you, as a parent, stay mentally strong, but also instill certain things in your kids? What kind of exercises can you do for yourself? But what kind of exercises can you teach your kids? And when that book came out, I started getting a lot of questions from uh, people specifically asking, well, what does it mean to be a mentally strong woman? And I realized that a lot of these examples that we have of, of mental toughness are men. Maybe it's a Navy SEAL. Maybe it's a pro athlete. 
Uh, but we don't really talk that much about women. What does it look like to be a mentally strong woman in today's world? And then, of course, in light of the Me Too movement and a lot of the conversations going around about the same time as I was thinking about writing the book, all just seemed to make it come together that I thought, yeah, I'm going to write a book that specifically for women, our experiences are a little bit different than men's and we have different cultural expectations and we're raised a little bit differently. And the more I thought about it, the more it just made sense to say, let's write this book for women. And I'm thrilled that I did. Okay. That's fascinating. Um, you touched on right there that we're raised a little differently, women and men or boys and girls. Can you speak a little more of that and how that shows up with the mental strength? Yeah. So, you know, I think it's subtle yet huge. Uh, so for example, one of the studies shows that when we ask little girls and little boys when they're four years old, do you want to play the game for kids who are really, really smart or the game for kids who try really, really hard? Almost all the boys and all the girls say, oh, I want to play this game for smart kids. Hmm. And we ask those kids when they're six, you want to play the game for really, really smart kids or the game for kids who try really, really hard? And all the little boys still say, I want to play the game for smart kids. Almost all the little girls say, I want to play the one for the kids who try really, really hard. Mm. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of studies like that that just show how when we, you know, girls and boys uh, have some differences in the way they think about brilliance, for example. Same thing at age four, girls point to pictures of women when they say who's brilliant and they show them a spreadsheet of men and women. Women, girls pick women, boys pick men. And then when they ask them at age six, who do you think's brilliant? Almost all the kids pick men. Wow. And so you think, well, what happens between ages four and six? Well, they start kindergarten. Mm. You know, just the way that um, as adults, we talk to girls, we, you know, whether we call them a princess or we tell them they're pretty. And we talk to boys about being smart or, you know, the examples that we use of who's a rocket scientist, who, who goes to the moon, who uh, tends to have a lot of the really important careers, who are our politicians. They're almost all men. And I think we're just sending these messages to, to girls and boys without even realizing that we're doing it or the toys that they play with and the ways we interact. So I think we have a long way to go. But I think just shedding light on that of, okay, if you were raised in a certain way and you've got these subtle messages, how does it affect your mental strength? How does it impact how you see yourself and your uh, abilities and your competence and how far you can go in the world? Oh, I just love that. And that is something for me, I had a very dominant father and he really did enforce some of these messages, not quite subtly <laughs> either at times. And uh, so some of the, you know, the rules you had for women, um, I liked number nine, where you said you don't let others limit your potential. And then also number 12 and 13, they don't feel bad about reinventing themselves and they don't downplay their successes. The success piece was something that has been a challenge for me and um, is still a challenge as I coach people. I talk about having yay me moments and sort of the freedom to have these moments to say, yeah, you know what? I did that really well and not have some of the past programming on what that messaging means or what that means for, a, you know, as a woman, will you should or shouldn't um, speak up for yourself? Or do you see that at all? And I do. And it's something I personally struggle with as well. But when we look at women, you know, just for example, on LinkedIn, uh, if you have a man and a woman who have very similar experiences at, in terms of their career, men will tend to be on one end of the spectrum where they talk about how many skills they have, how much expertise they have. They're on the more bragging end. Whereas women tend to be far too humble to the point where they downplay, oh, it was no big deal, or I did this for a couple of years, but they don't really uh, shed light on it. And it really affects who gets hired. That's just one big thing. And but also when we look at compliments, how do women respond to compliments? As women, we're much more likely to say things like, oh, it was nothing, or we give a compliment back, or we tend to minimize it uh, ourselves. It's sort of like we shrink ourselves in an effort to make sure we don't make anybody feel bad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's something I have to work on in my own life too, to be able to just say thank you when I get a compliment and to not have to feel like I need to, you know, somehow downplay it or minimize it or worry about if I'm offending somebody and, and that it's okay to talk about your success. You can say to somebody, I worked really hard. I'm proud of what I did, but for some reason we tend to feel arrogant or we are afraid that we're going to look like a narcissist. So we play it really small. And I don't think we need to do that. I think as women, it's okay to say, I'm okay with what I've achieved. I'm really impressed with, with all the hard work I was able to put in and the fact that it paid off. And to know that saying that doesn't make you, doesn't make you arrogant and you can still be 
humble, but you don't have to pretend like you are, are less than you are. I love that. And that feeds into this growth mindset that there's more than enough for all of us too. instead of this, um, you know, number eight, they don't put others down to lift themselves up. It's more, you know, I can speak to how maybe I did something successfully at work and then also appreciate that my fellow coach friend also did something amazing and that it's not, it's not a win or lose game or black and white. Like there's only enough room for me at the table that there's room Exactly. That you can have five amazing people at work. And if you happen to do something amazing, it doesn't mean that nobody else did. And just having that mentality and knowing that, that you, there's shared space and that if you lift somebody else up, you're not putting yourself down either, but also that you don't have to put people down to feel like you're climbing the social hierarchy that, you know, we do our best when as women, we encourage each other, we cheer one another on, we help each other, we celebrate each other's successes. But it's sort of ingrained in us sometimes to not do that. We just want to compete. We want to compare ourselves. We want to try to fight to get to the top. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the end, I think we all lose when we do that. So it's really about reframing that and reminding yourself that you aren't in direct competition with all the women around you. Yeah, absolutely. And so what are some small steps people can take to sort of get to that place where they can, you know, acknowledge their success, but then also, um, you know, some of this feeds into what you've spoken on on social media, where we're like, we're comparing ourselves and feeling this, you know, well, if she's having this great, well, then I need to sort of one up the other. I'm, I would just love for people to start sort of being more open to all of us succeeding and growing and yeah. So one thing when it comes to your own success is to just practice when you get a compliment, just say, thank you. And it feels mm -hmm. uncomfortable if you're not used to it, but, but just try it or say, thank you so much for pointing that out. Uh, or you can point out if you're really afraid of looking like, like you're going to be arrogant. Cause it's sometimes it feels like when you say thank you, you're sort of implying, yeah, I know, I know I'm awesome. So you can turn around it to your effort and just say, you know, thank you for acknowledging that I really put in a lot of effort and I'm glad it's paid off. Something oh, I like that a lot. Yeah. Really just pinpoint your effort and not necessarily your, you know, how your characteristics. And when it comes to other people, we know that yes, social media often drives this resentment, feelings of envy, and turns things into a competition. Uh, Instagram is kind of the worst for our mental health, according to studies, because we're just looking at images often of women who look like they have more money, that they're more successful, that they uh, tend to be you know, fitness experts. And it can cause us to start thinking, my life isn't as good as that person's. But research will show if rather than look at people as your direct competition, you should look at them as opinion holders. So you might say, well, this person has information that I don't. I could learn from them rather than thinking this person is, is better than I am and I'll never be that good. So it's about reframing the thoughts that you have and just recognizing, well, how does social media, how do I feel when I look at social media? If it doesn't make you feel good, you probably want to limit your time on it or figure <laughs> out how do I spread kindness on social media. Maybe you make it a goal. I'm going to say three nice things to people when I log in today. And when you start to be kind to other people, it raises your happiness. The more ha the happier you are, the more likely you are to be kind. And you can start this snowball effect rather than just sort of mindlessly scrolling through social media like like we all do sometimes. And you waste 10 or 15 minutes, shut it off, and, and then you actually don't feel any better about your life. You're more likely to feel worse. Mm -hmm. I really like that. And that feeds into how you speak of mental energy and sort of us having a finite amount of mental energy and to be conscious of where we're sort of wasting our mental energy or spinning our wheels. Um, yeah. And, and the intentionality behind our time on social media to have some, you know, I like to encourage clients and listeners to say, you know, before you pick up your phone, okay, what is your intent? You're getting on Instagram for 10 minutes, you getting on Facebook to check your what happened with your aunt's wedding this weekend, or, you know, and then how to hold yourself to that. Um, at sort of the before social media stage, and then ask also the after what you just addressed, how do you feel after that? You know, okay, so you spent that time on Facebook, how do you feel? Uh, what is some guidance you give with social media? Uh, you know, all of those are great tips because I think it's become such a mindless activity. I know I've done this before. You're looking at Facebook and then you go to open Facebook and you realize you're already looking at Facebook <laughs> or, you, <laughs> or, you know, you spend 15 minutes scrolling and then when you're done and you, if you assess, well, what did I just look at? And you can't even recall anything because it was so mindless that you were just doing it. And so for 
people who have an app or something on your phone that tells you how much time you spend on social media, it can be quite eye opening. 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, it really adds up over the course of the day. And, and when you really examine, is that really how I wanted to have spent say four hours of my day or 45 minutes of my time, you might think, no, it's really not enhancing my life that much. So then maybe you set time limits. Maybe you decide I'll check social media at lunch and once again at dinner, but other than that, I'm not going to do it or I'll check it, you know, 2 PM, whatever it is, but to just set some guidelines for yourself so that you become more aware of how you're using it and how it's affecting your life. Mm -hmm. I really like that. And that, so I want to switch gears a little and move into, um, my one of my three favorite books of yours, which <laughs> they're all my favorite, I can't, but the, the one for mentally strong parents. And I have um, five boys, and I find myself, you know, with all 13 of them, I was like, oh, yeah, some more than others. And I really, I really encourage listeners to run out and get all three of the books. But if you're a parent, specifically the yellow one, which is on parents, but I love, could you speak a little bit about what, because I see this a lot. Um, number three, they don't make their child the center of the universe. Yeah, this one, I was surprised. I got a lot of feedback on from people who said, no, you're supposed to make your kids the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. And I was just surprised that so many people felt so strongly about it. But you know, I think it's so important to make your kids a, a top priority in your life, obviously, but making your kids the center of the universe is different. It's when uh, parents lose sight of their values. They start to forget what's important in their life. Their entire lives revolve around hockey practice and making sure that their kids are happy all the time. And, and they're not teaching their kids skills. You know, when you grow up, your boss, your future partner, your roommates aren't going to treat you as if the universe revolves around you. But when kids grow up in that environment, they, they think the world literally revolves around them. And it's tough. They struggle in relationships. They have a, a lot more difficulty um, in dealing with setbacks and problems. So I think it's good for parents to know that you, can, you need your own life outside of just being a parent. So you need to have activities, things you're interested in. You can say no to your kids, mm -hmm. that you can make it clear to them that you know, you're not going to overindulge them, that they're not always going to get everything they want. But just opportunities to teach them life lessons through all of those sorts of things are really important. I love that. And I also have to draw attention that what I really appreciate in this book of yours is that you then, you go through the chapter you know, whatever the, this mentally strong thing is that people don't do. And then you, you break it down into things, ways we can specifically help with preschoolers, school age kids and teenagers. And that was really helpful for me, especially with this chapter. What I liked is, you know, you didn't make the kid the center of your universe, which I did for many years until, um, it, you know, you keep doing what you're doing until it's not working anymore. So until pretty much um, my midlife reawakening, not a crisis, it was a reawakening. Yeah. But then I sort of shifted and was like, okay, wait a minute, how is that helping my kids? And, and what I liked in this chapter specifically is how you then speak of the, you know, let's teach kids they aren't the center of the universe, because as you just spoke to, that that's not helpful to them. And you go through specific examples on how we can do that. And I am grateful that you did that. And also um, that you point out how, you know, kids who know their place in the world become adults who contribute to society and um, very helpful. Could Good. you also, yeah. Could Glad you also to speak to you number it. four, sorry, that they don't allow fear to dictate their choices. Cause this is another one that I find still when I'm parenting, if I pause and back up, I'm like, Ooh, is fear driving that Susie? It's, you know, being a parent is scary in general, and it's supposed to be scary, but sometimes we make choices in a way that tries to limit our own anxiety rather than what's best for our kids. And so it's important to think about that. Well, do I not want them to go to this event just because I'll be anxious or is this particular event actually not good for them? Or is it tough to me for me to watch my kid go on the monkey bars because I'm envisioning them falling, but you know, really it's fine and they need to practice their, their skills, their physical skills, their social skills, and I need to let them do this. And it, it's hard to do. And when you've always sort of come from a, a place of fear and your goal in life is to limit your fear, then it's hard to let go and say, I can handle being anxious. This is going to be really anxiety provoking for me, but I'm going to do it anyway. And, um, but once you do that, then you're able to start making the best decisions for your kids. You teach them about anxiety teach them how to handle their emotions better and it's better for everyone in the long run. Yeah, I really like that. And I like the idea of not just 
physical fear, but I hear a lot of parents, you know, when I question them about their, however they parented and their excuse will be like, well, they don't want their kid to be sad or they don't want their kid to be upset or disappointed, um, which is also parenting out of fear. Could you explain that a little? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, nobody wants to see their kid be upset. And, but sometimes then we become their regulators. We start cheering them up. We start calming them down and we don't give them the skills that they need to deal with those things. And sort of going back to social media, I think there's so much pressure right now to be a happy parent who's raising a happy kid. Mm -hmm. You see all of these images where everybody looks like they're just happy all the time. And we think, well, if my child is upset, then I must be doing something wrong. We tend to personalize it and we forget that disappointment, embarrassment, fear, those are all opportunities for us to work on ourselves, but also to teach our kids. How do you cope with those uncomfortable emotions? How do you deal with that? And then we give them lifelong skills that are much more likely to set them up for success. Yes. Yeah. I think it's, it's wonderful. Um, could you speak a little about how they mentally strong parents don't give their child power over them? Sure. So, you know, I think back in the day, uh, my grandparents' age, uh, you know, we really focused on, you know, sort of father knows best where we focused on making sure kids were seen and not heard and parents were the rulers. And then we figured out, well, that's not always the best thing. You know, kids grow up thinking that uh, you know, mom and dad are, are the end-all be-all and they aren't necessarily gaining skills. So the pendulum kind of swung the other way where we thought, let's empower kids. Let's give them more choices. Let's make them part of the family and, and make it clear that we value their opinions. But then we went too far and we started, you know, giving kids a vote as if they were an adult in the family. Like, do you think we should move? Do you think we should buy that house? What do you think we should do about this? And just giving them way too much power or the kids would have power over, you know, the TV. What are we going to watch or how are we going to spend Saturdays? And, you know, when we do that to kids, they don't have the skills that they need to be a leader. They're not supposed to be. And it's actually quite anxiety provoking for kids to think that they're in charge they need to know that parents are in charge. Parents are going to say no. Parents know best. But on the other hand, your parents still value your opinion, that you can still offer input. But your parents aren't necessarily going to follow that advice. <laughs> uh, but it's hard. You know, in today's world of helicopter parenting versus free range parenting and all of these different mm -hmm. ideas that are swirling around, sometimes it's hard to find that middle ground of saying, how do I make sure that my child sees me as an authority figure, but at the same time, my child knows that I, that I care about their feelings, that I'm invested in, in listening to their opinion, that I value their ideas, but that at the same time, I know that I'm ultimately the one in charge. Yeah, I really like that. And that sort of goes right into the rule um, that you don't let children avoid responsibility. I don't see what number that is, number seven, um, and how we can help children sort of ex accept responsibility, not only for their life, um, but then also around the house. And you speak a bit to that. Yeah. You know, statistically, it's a, something like 82% of us adults did chores when we were kids. Mm -hmm. Only 28% of kids in today's world actually do chores. Oh, wow. As parents, we tend to think, well, you know, he's so much going on in school. He doesn't have time for this. Or I wanted to, to have an opportunity to just be a kid. But one of the biggest predictors of success is childhood chores. When they look at four-year-olds who do chores, those kids are much more likely to, to go on and, and become successful as adults. And they think it's partly because kids can learn how do you pitch into the community? How can you help out? It gives them confidence. They feel like, okay, I'm a competent kid. I can do this stuff. And so I think it's really important. It's one simple thing. Make sure your kids have chores. Make sure it's clear that you expect them to do it. You don't always have to pay them for everything they do. You want them to know I can pitch in and, and help out and be a team player and not always do it just for the reward. And, and to make sure that we're giving kids natural consequences too. If you have a kid who always forgets his basketball sneakers when he goes to basketball practice and yet you bail him out by running up and delivering <laughs> them, they're not going to learn. And it's tough to not do that. And in our world where there are so many helicopter parents who are constantly bailing their kids out, it can feel like, well, if my kid misses out on one thing, forgets his homework once, or he forgets to, to bring his sports equipment, then somehow they're going to fall behind because mm -hmm. every other parent seems to be bailing their kids out. <laughs> But kids need to have natural consequences. They need to know that their, that their behavior does have a consequence and then they learn to be more responsible next time. So it's okay to let them fail sometimes and to make mistakes. And as long as you're there to guide them, uh, rather than bail them out, they'll learn from it so that when they do get out of the house, they'll be much more equipped to deal with the realities of life.
Oh, so wonderful. It's great. I love it. Thank you. Um, well, this podcast is called the Love Your Life Show. And I speak of things that we do, you know, that not every moment is going to be rainbows and daisies, <laughs> as has certainly been your experience, but that we can do certain things um, to increase, you know, to, to love our lives in this current moment right here, right now. Are there certain things that you do every day or every morning to set yourself up for success or to sort of protect that mental strength? I do. So as you can see from the background, I live on a boat. And uh, so I live on a sailboat most of the year in the Florida Keys, which I love to be out in nature and I love to be outside. And I'm lucky enough to live in a place where there's you know, dolphins and manatees that come and play on my boat. So mm. I eat breakfast outside every day to start my morning off right. And uh, I love to run. So in the evenings, uh, I go running. And it's one of the highlights of my day is to, to know that, okay, at the end of the day, I get to just go run off all this energy because I spend a lot of time sitting behind my computer. And um, but it's something I now look forward to. So I guess starting my morning off right by being in nature and starting the evening off by saying, I'm going to go running and burn off some excess energy. Uh, whatever happens in between those two things, now I can, I can handle it. And it makes life seem a lot better to me. Well, you've got your list for in between those times. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Great. Well, Amy, I am I am sure my listeners are going to be like, where can we find more Amy? So we know about your three books and I will have links to that in the show notes at www.smbwell.com slash 43. But are there other ways that listeners can get in touch with you or do you have certain programs that you're running? Yeah, so my website is Amy Morin, LCSW is in licensed clinical social worker.com. And on my website, I have information about my online course. And I have another one that's going to be for kids actually launching this summer and my oh. books and a link to my TEDx talk and articles and all sorts of other information on there about mental strength. Awesome. What is your course? Uh, so I teamed up with a pro athlete and an NFL player. So together we're going to make a 30-day course in the month of July that will be live webinars with kids teaching them mental strength exercises. Oh, what fun. Okay. Yes. We will be checking that out. I love you. I love <laughs> it. When I <laughs> Thank you so much for taking time to chat with us. I will have those links in the show notes. And let's all head out there, warriors, and live lives we love with this mental strength of things that we do not do. Go get our books. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> Thank you.